we don't need cops, courts, and jails for everything. I think right now we need to be making sure we are keeping people safe. There's a criminal side and there's a civil side. Former public defender Nicole Thomas Kennedy wants to stop prosecuting most misdemeanors and reduce police funding if she's elected Seattle's next city attorney. We have too many people becoming victims of crime. In contrast, lawyer and mediator Ann Davison wants to enforce the laws on the books and supports hiring more police officers if she wins the November vote. I think that what we're missing is a strong voice to push back on police. It's a tight race with opposing ideas about what's best for Seattle. And you also don't dehumanize and insult people for an occupation. The citywide race for Seattle City Attorney, next on City Inside Out. Welcome to this edition of City Inside Out. I'm your host, Brian Callanan. After a surprising defeat of incumbent Pete Holmes in the August primary, Nicole Thomas Kennedy and Ann Davison present some new, very different choices for Seattle City Attorney. Thomas Kennedy is a police abolitionist who says she won't prosecute most misdemeanors if elected, focusing on diversion programs rather than what she calls prosecuting poverty. Her opponent, attorney Ann Davison, says Seattle needs to return a sense of safety to the public, enforcing our laws and providing what she calls collaborative, compassionate leadership. This approach to criminal justice is just one of many contrasting views between two candidates who both say they want safer streets but offer much different routes to get there. I'll just go over a couple points on the platform. Nicole Thomas Kennedy is a former public defender who wants to abolish police and jails by building up a new system of public health and safety. My top agenda item is making sure that we shift resources away from punishment and into social programs. Thomas Kennedy placed first in the August primary, winning more than 36% of the vote and pushing out three-term incumbent Pete Holmes. As of early October, she's raised about $232,000 for her campaign. She's endorsed by city council member Teresa Mosqueda state rep Kirsten harris Talley, the health care workers of SEIU, and the grocery store workers of UFCW 21. I don't want to prosecute poverty at all. Thomas Kennedy says she would not pursue criminal cases on most misdemeanors, instead putting resources towards a compensation fund for crime victims and individualized service plans for those accused of crimes caught up in the legal system. Whether it's mental health, where it's sub substance use, it's clearly a problem where people aren't having their needs met. So we need to figure out how to do that. And that's what's going to stop the problem. She says she'd rather focus on filing civil suits against companies harming Seattle's environment, not finding more money for the SPD. If prisons and police made us safer, the United States would be the safest country in the world. I don't agree that we need to hire more police. I don't think more police le leads to more safety. Thomas Kennedy says the decades-long effort to reform the police will never lead to justice. And the best way to prevent crime is through investing in community-based services. So it really is about community building and, uh, and building programs that's going to make community healthy so we don't have these things happening over and over again. On homelessness, Thomas Kennedy does not support sweeping encampments but rather putting resources towards a housing first model to get more people off the street. We really need to be making sure that we are giving people what they need to be able to survive and be self-reliant. And that's not congregate shelter. That's not a sweep. That is permanent affordable housing. Someone just walked up and punched him in the face. Arbitrator and attorney Ann Davison says she's about enforcing the law so that the rest of society can function. I think right now we need to be making sure we are keeping people safe. Davison, who ran for city council in 2019 and lieutenant governor in 2020, came in second in the August primary with nearly 33 percent of the vote. She's raised about $179,000 for her campaign as of early October. She's endorsed by the Seattle Times, the Seattle Building Trades Council, and former governors Gary Locke, Chris Gregoire, and Dan Evans.
The approach really is what are our laws. Davison opposes okay. Thomas Kennedy's idea of not prosecuting most misdemeanors and says she wants to help crime victims in criminal court. I, I can totally understand that. The role of our city attorney is to make sure that we are dealing with what our societal limits are to protect them. So the prosecution has to be there. Davison is also speaking out about her opponent's abolitionist approach to the police department. She says reform is not sufficient. I think there is meaningful reform. Davison says by building a better relationship between the SPD and the city attorney's office, it will be possible to hold officers more accountable and make Seattle safer. It's linking together agencies and departments. That together is what creates public safety. We're going to get better results when we can work with people, not demonizing them. She's been critical of the city's approach to unauthorized encampments and says she wants to get people off the street in a way that is safe and compassionate. And we can bring the city back to a place where we're restoring public health and public safety, reconciling the fact that we are no longer leaving people that are uh, unhoused that need help. We can adequately do that and keep our public safe. It's a clash of diametrically opposed legal ideologies in the race for Seattle city attorney. I really want to focus more on diversion programs, programs that meet people's needs. City attorney is a place where we can hold our societal limits so that the rest of society can function and flourish. And we have both candidates with us, Nicole Thomas Kennedy and Ann Davison. I thank you very much for joining us, both of you. We had a coin flip before the start of the show. And Nicole, you'll be speaking first. Tell us why you are running for this position and your qualifications, please. Sure. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate this opportunity. I'm running for city attorney because I know that my plan will make us all safer. I'm a middle-aged mom to a young kid who wants safety and stability for my family and for all our neighbors. My opponent and the right-wing media are intentionally stoking people's fears. I believe Seattle is better, smarter, and stronger than those fears. I have worked in our criminal justice system. My opponent has not. I have done over 400 criminal cases and 200 civil cases. And I can tell you that the current policy and practices are not working. They are creating more poverty and desperation, not less. I believe in prosecuting where data shows it will make us safer. The data is clear that prosecuting poverty does not make us safer. Communities that are the safest are the ones that are the healthiest, not the ones that are over-policed. The people of Seattle need a city attorney who is aligned with and prepared to defend the policies passed by our elected council. We need the jumpstart tax and rental protections that are under attack from a wealthy few who want to move us backward. I am the candidate best qualified and prepared to lead those efforts. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for that. And I'll give you another shot here at an opening statement, please. Thanks for having me today, Brian. It's nice to see you. I'm running for city attorney because we need to have professional, nonpartisan leadership if we are to see civility, livability, and respect return to our city. I'm an independent thinker and a Seattle mom, not an activist ideologue. And this approach is vitally important to implement our laws and to enhance public health and safety. If elected, I'll make sure our approach is fair and professional and balanced. With criminal law enforcement, we will focus on high impact crime, centering victims of crime and build upon alternative interventions with accountability. I will surround myself with seasoned experts wanting to serve the public. I've been a lawyer since 2005. I've practiced law for over 15 years. I serve as an arbitrator, as a teacher, I've been a lawyer on the preventative side, making sure that we avoid litigation at, at all costs. It is important to make sure that we are people in place who want to lead with collaboration, not dehumanize, not demonize, and alienate other people in our city. Thank you very much for that. I want to talk about one issue that separates you both, your approach to misdemeanors, talking about crimes like shoplifting all the way up to DUIs. Nicole, you've said you would not prosecute most misdemeanors. Now, I want to talk about this. I want to understand why that's the case, what you mean by that, and how that could impact public safety if you're elected. Sure. So the reason that I say that I don't want to prosecute most misdemeanors is because data indicates that prosecuting most mis misdemeanors is not in the interest, interest of deterrence or public safety. And so when I talk about prosecuting poverty, for instance, the things I'm talking about are sleeping under an awning, shoplifting food because you're hungry, there's nothing about prosecuting those things that makes a person have shelter or makes them less hungry. It just wastes millions of dollars um, destabilizing people further. There are also things where, um, you know, there's just there's other approaches that might work better than traditional prosecution and jail. So even when we're talking about cases of interpersonal violence, I've said 
you know, for those types of cases, prosecution must remain an option. But I think there needs to be a wider array of community based services available to people. And I also think that we need to be survivor centered. And so given that I've spent so much time working within the criminal system, I've talked to a lot of survivors as I have talked to survivors during my candidacy. And some people might be surprised to know that survivors by and large don't want more punishment. What they want is the support they need to feel safe. So that includes um, housing, transportation, things that are going to create long-term safety, and they want to be heard. So that will be the focus of my office, will be on survivor safety. I will also, when it comes to economic crimes, you know, currently people and small businesses have to pick up the tab for crimes of poverty um, that are, you know, the result of policy choices. So my office will have a victim's compensation fund for people and small businesses who've been harmed by people who are unable to pay restitution. And the um, the total restitution that was unpaid last year was $90,000. And I think that's something that we can easily make whole. Okay, thank you for that. And I know you have a different approach on this when it comes to misdemeanors and your opponent. Let's talk about your policy when it comes to these kind of crimes and how would that impact public safety in Seattle if you're elected? Let's be clear, uh, no one in Seattle wants to criminalize poverty. We are a compassionate city, and that is not the approach of any of us, including me. What we're talking about is making sure that we have respectable standards, that we are actually intervening and helping people at a time when we really can. We can make a difference in someone's life. When we are talking about misdemeanors, they do matter. Uh, when we are talking about domestic violence, it does matter. There are lethality factors that indicate whether that is going to increase. We must be intervening to take place for victims. We need to be there for them in a way that is meaningful, not just some talk. We need to make sure that we are protecting them and that is what our laws are for. Our, our values of society are reflected in our laws and that is to mean something so that I don't harm you and you don't harm me in a way that we are moving forward. And I don't see that from my opponent. I see that when we're closing into a million people in our city, that is not the way forward practically. Okay. Uh, Nicole, I, I heard your name said there, and I wanted to make sure you had a chance to respond here briefly. And then, Ann, I'll give you a follow-up. Please, Nicole, if you could. Sure. So my approach isn't ignoring harm. I'm the survivor of crime. Um, a lot of people I know are the survivors of crime. I'm not saying the harm is not taking place. What I'm saying is our current approach is not making is not preventing the situation from happening again. And so if we want true public safety, we need to turn away from the system that we have been putting all of our money and energy into that just focuses on abusers or the people who are committing crimes and really get to the root causes of what are to the root causes of those things. What, what are what is causing that behavior? What can we do to ameliorate those yeah. situations so it doesn't happen again? And also, what can we do to repair the people who have been harmed? Just going back to you on this one, and it sounds this idea of getting to the root causes. I wanted to make sure you responded to that piece of it, because that's a criticism I'm hearing out of this. Sure. And I've always talked about needing to understand why is someone communicating in the form of a crime? That is absolutely our social responsibility. But when it comes to the role of city attorney, it is to hold the societal limits. What do our laws say? It is not the catch all place of where we address every social issue. That is going to be the obligation of legislative action. And that is what our city council and mayor can decide budgetary wise. When we're talking about yeah. housing and transportation, we're talking about what is the role for city attorney in regards to crime. Okay. All right. And Ann, I'll stick with you and talk about what some of our elected officials are speaking about regarding police funding specifically. So the city of Seattle is in the process of reimagining public safety, involving fewer armed officers and more resources going towards community-based solutions. The data from the city shows the majority of calls coming into 911 do not need an armed officer responding. So I want you, I want you to answer this question. Do you agree with the council's direction of reducing resources to police? That is what the council gets to decide. I think it's important to understand, look, looking at the calling log, what is it happening in our city with the crime rates? Uh, mm -hmm. And that is going to be something that we have to address. And, and the city attorney's role is not budgetary decisions. Okay. Uh, Nicole, maybe I'll take a, a, another swipe at this with you here. You've taken an abolitionist stance when it comes to police and jails. I know some communities around the Seattle area are calling for more police, though. We're seeing in Seattle over the last few months that gun violence is way up, for example. Do you think your stance, your position should make communities feel safer, this abolitionist stance? 
I do. And so the, what abolition is, it's not an overnight process where uh, police and prisons disappear. Abolition is a process of building up community-based support, services, and accountability. That means we don't need police and prisons for everything. So it's not an immediate taking away with nothing there. It's the building up of those things. And the city attorney absolutely has a role in those things. So the city attorney has prosecutorial discretion and that discretion, you're, uh, and every prosecutor has the responsibility to decide which crimes to pursue. And that's a special responsibility. And that responsibility is supposed to be furthered to seek justice. Prosecutors are supposed to do justice. They're not supposed to convict for every single crime. Also, the city attorney has a responsibility to public safety. So in the interest of justice and safety, it's not just a math equation. We have to really think about what is going to generate public safety. And if that's not putting people in jail, then that's not what I'm going to do. Okay. Thank you for that. And I want to follow up with you another related question when it comes to police. The role you might play in helping work out a deal with the main police union for the city of Seattle, the Seattle Police Guild, been without a contract for almost a year. What accountability measures are needed there? How do you get buy-in from rank and file officers on that? The city attorney plays a role in this. It does. And when we have rhetoric going out that we, we wish them ill harm, uh, I think that we're getting nowhere. It is really important to understand that when we're talking about a leader, we're talking about someone who takes things seriously and particularly in their conduct and how they communicate with others. When we're talking about needing to have police officers in some regards for our public safety, they need to know that they have accountability standards and they must be required and they must be upheld. And I would be part of that. I take that on myself personally mm -hmm. and on for the department. Uh, but, but it is also that we need to have them. Uh, we need to have reform and safety. They're not mutually exclusive. Uh, and you're going to get a better outcome when you invite someone to be part of the change instead of demonizing, dehumanizing, and wishing ill harm on them. Okay, thank you very much for that. Nicole, get your take here on the Seattle Police Officers Guild trying to work out a deal that has accountability and buy-in from officers here. You've heard what your opponent has said about this with this idea of police reform. I think you have some different ideas on that. Please lay them out for us. Sure, so I support all reform measures that don't expand the budget. I absolutely 100% that we need accountability in the new police contract. And that was something that was kind of given away in the last one. Um, there's a lot of oversight measures that the community, the community police uh, committee has laid them out very well for the city about what's not in there, including arbitration clauses. Um, after firing, um, forced arbitration, the um, secondary employment overtime, there's a lot of things in there. And I think that what we're missing is a strong voice to push back on police. What we've had for years and years is deference. And deference is what got us to a place where last year, you know, despite a judge um, and the city council, you know, the uh, police department gassed my neighborhood over 10 times and uh, then abandoned their precinct over the orders of their chief. Obviously, we're missing a huge amount of accountability measures and we're not going to get those in the police contract by um, by continuing to be deferential. So okay. I think that there is there's like a role of authority in that position to um, to be able to represent the people and what they need. And that is the role that I will play in those contract negotiations. And let me make sure I follow up with you on this point. Do you think that the city of Seattle has been too deferential to its police unions? I disagree, and I also know that my opponent has said that reform is not good enough, that they must be abolished. So it seems to be, uh, I'm not quite sure where she stands on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I have always been shown to talk about reform and safety, and I have the endorsement of reform leaders uh, because they say we do want to have police. That means we want to have accountability. Uh, and I agree with what happened with the arbitrator's award. I'm an arbitrator. I've had award challenges. I understand that that has to be taking place. But, but you don't just completely take down the system. You don't completely say, we do not need them whatsoever. And you also don't dehumanize and insult people for an occupation. Uh, there's no deference that's going on. It is going to be impartial legal advice. That is what has to be maintained in that office. Okay. Uh, Nicole, I thought I heard something that had your, had your name right all over it when it comes to your stance on this and your abolitionist stance. Any quick response you'd like to give here before we move on? Sure, that the city attorney is an advocate for the people. Um, they, they need to be, the city attorney needs to be accountable to the people and the police need to be accountable to, uh, to the people as well. And I have not said that I think police should disappear overnight. That is not what abolition is. I've tried to define it many times. It's something that happens while community builds up. 
policing, the need for policing comes down, but I absolutely support um, reforms and they're sorely needed. You know, we're talking about the difference between maybe some how some people in community react to, to police versus what is actually in the police contract. Those are very different things and they should not be confused. And what we need is accountability in the contract. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. I want to move on. And Nicole, I'll talk to you about homelessness as we move along here. A huge issue for many voters out there. I want to talk about unauthorized encampments, sweeps, clearing public pla uh, public places. This is really a crisis of visible homelessness that's grown steadily worse over the past decade, certainly so during the pandemic. What's your approach to these camps and what guidance would you give the mayor or city council on, the, on that issue? So I think my first approach would be one of what what is going to actually solve this problem. So, um, you know, just how I feel about it is the sweeps seem to kind of move the problem around and destabilize people further. They don't, um, you know, despite how many times we sweep encampments still exist because people don't have anywhere to go. Legally, I think this is not a super great practice. There's some Ninth Circuit uh, case law that doesn't seem to support um, sweeping, especially when we don't have places for people to go. And that's the reality right now is we just don't have enough shelter for people. Um, and the research shows that this isn't gonna solve the problem. So as city attorney, I would really like to partner with the city and the county to figure out how we can get more people housed and move people inside. That's what's going to take care of this problem. Okay, and I think you have a different stance on homelessness and these unauthorized encampments, and I wanna hear about it. I know you've been critical about the way the city has handled these camps. What solutions are you hoping to bring to, to the table? How would you advise the council and mayor on this issue? Well, let's be clear separately, like this is a policy choice on some, on some regards. And then there is a matter of the interpretation of the law. Uh, homelessness is why I've become politically active. I worked in a refugee camp on the border of Cambodia where people were fleeing civil war, and it was more humane and hygienic than what we've left people alongside the roadways to subsist here in Seattle. And I participated in that King County point in time in the middle of the night where we got to that 11,751, which was the last number that we have counted uh, in January of 2020. So this is something that I take personal uh, responsibility to make sure that we are, I'm doing my part, what I can do with my skill set. So what I think personally should occur is something different though. And, and I think that it's bigger than what the city attorney can do. In regards to what the city attorney can do, it can give interpretations of case law. Uh, the, the case that is referenced here, Martin B. Boise, is one that has been interpreted in some regards, like my opponent has suggested, uh, but I think that the holding is, is, some, is different. Uh, and so we're not looking to criminalize status or anything like that, not whatsoever. But there is a way that you can look at legal strategies so that we can get people help. We can also make sure that the rest of society can function in a productive way. Uh, and it is, again, where in society does the rest of the obligation go? Uh, that is separate from the city attorney's office. And I want to make sure I'm clear on this. Do you support some sort of sweep type of activity when it comes to these unauthorized encampments or how would you actually approach them? That's not my decision. I would be able to provide the legal advice of what the law provides and those who are elected to create that policy and make that decision. That's their decision. OK, OK. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to move on to another piece here. And Nicole, I'll get your take on this uh, prostitution in the city of Seattle. You've spoken out about decriminalizing sex work. Why is that important to you? What do you want to let voters know about that? So, I mean, my position is I think that we should decriminalize sex work. Uh, can the city attorney decriminalize sex work on their own? No. But what I can do is not prosecute prostitution. Um, it's, you know, prosecution is intrusive. It's destabilizing. It costs a, a lot of money. And we're when we talk about prostitution, we're really talking about crimes of survival. And so instead of spending thousands and thousands of dollars uh, prosecuting johns or prostitutes we could be giving that money to the women and the people that are out in the street who so desperately need it we are never going to be able to arrest and jail every person what we need to do is limit the vulnerability of people and right now that's not what we're doing that's the approach i would take i just it doesn't reduce the problem it doesn't solve the problem and it doesn't make victims less vulnerable i would also add that i do support decriminalizing prostitution because i do support decriminalizing consent consensual sex work in service of finding human traffickers. Right now, consensual sex workers are in the best position to identify um, who is actually being trafficked, but they aren't actually, they aren't able to go to the police and talk about those things because they're currently criminalized. So I think that's, that's my position on that. I don't want to go on too long. Thank you very much for that. And what's your take on decriminalizing sex work? When we're talking about people who are pushed to the margins and are having to survive, I think that quitting on them is not the answer. Uh, I think protecting them is the answer, 
I think when I listen to people who have been subjected to such treatment, when people are feeling unsafe, uh, I need to listen to them and I need to say, what is it that we can do uh, in the city attorney's office? And when we're talking about a crime like that, it, it does permeate beyond just the individual. We must do appropriate addressing for that individual, of course, but it also is in regards to businesses and families and everyone else around the area that has concern uh, because it has a public safety impact. It has a public health impact. It is larger than just one person. And we're, I just am not gonna quit for women. I'm gonna make sure that we are there for all type of survivors, uh, regardless of when they're in that situation. So, so it should be prosecuted. I just wanna make sure I'm clear on your stance there. I think it's important what I've heard from, from, the, from the survivors of that uh, is to look at what we've been doing currently with the incumbent, which is looking at the purchasers. Mm, okay, got it. Thank you for that. I wonder if we can squeeze in one issue we haven't discussed in the session before we wrap up that you want voters to know about you or your campaign. Anne, can I give you a few seconds on that one? I am a Seattle mom, an independent thinker, uh, and I voted for Obama and Clinton and Biden. Uh, I am endorsed by Governors Gregoire and Locke. Uh, a large group of judicial officers who have been retired from the bench. Okay. Uh, it's important to understand that when I'm talking about a professional impartial leader at our city attorney's office, uh, you can look as to who is backing me and, and what that says. Okay, thank you for that. Nicole, an issue we haven't talked about that you wanna make sure voters know about you before we wrap up here. Sure, that I have a very strong defense, defense background. That's what I do. I am an advocate and I will be an advocate for this city. The thing that really gets left out of um, a lot of these campaign talks is the civil division of the office. The civil division of the city attorney's office is twice as big as the criminal division. And there is some very intense lit litigation going on in there right now, particularly around the jumpstart tax. Um, yep. The jumpstart tax is what we need to fund the Green New Deal, to fund new housing. It's gonna be what allows Seattle to pull us to pull us out of where we are as a city right now, um, but it's constantly under attack from large corporations, real estate landlord, uh, real estate moguls, and mega landlords. So I think uh, that's what I'm most looking forward to doing is advocating on behalf of Seattle and defending Seattle. Got it. Thanks. Time to wrap up the show. Closing statement time. Nicole, you're first. Sure, thank you. There's a reason that my campaign has been endorsed by all eight Democratic groups, the majority of unions, and elected leaders at every level of government. Seattle voters want humane, data-driven solutions that enable each of us to live our lives without fear, regardless of race or zip code. We all deserve to be safe and secure in our homes and on our streets. Seattle voters want a city attorney that will protect the progressive legislation passed by our city council against the greed of corporations and mega landlords. I hope to earn your vote next month. Thanks a lot for that 30 seconds, Ann. You get the last word. When my opponent has said who she would vote for, that tells you all you need to know. She would not give impartial legal advice to it, someone else elected into office. And that is clearly what voters need to understand. The role of city attorney is to give impartial legal advice and to rep all, represent all of us in, within the city of Seattle, to, for the people of Seattle. Uh, that is a critical aspect that is distinguished between us. I've been a civil attorney for my entire practice. I know how to run this department in a way that is collaborative as a leader, not as someone who tweets. Okay, thank you both very much for that. And we will be right back. What are people saying on social media about the race for Seattle City Attorney? One writes, let's make sure gun misdemeanors are prosecuted. Looking forward to Ann Davison as Seattle City Attorney. Another comments, this is why I'm voting for Nicole Thomas Kennedy. She's got plans to bring actual justice rather than simply incarcerate people for sport. We'd like to know what you think. Send us an email at contact at seattlechannel.org or find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Coming up next week, the race for King County Executive. Incumbent Dow Constantine faces a serious challenger in State Senator Joe Wen, who says he's impatient for changes in how the county tackles homelessness, climate change, and income inequality. The candidates face off right here on the next City Inside Out. I hope you join us.